Hi, hello class. Today I have a very, very special guest that I'm going to interview. His name is uh, Mr. DP. Uh, Mr. DP, can you uh, please introduce yourself to the uh, class? Hey, how you doing, class? My name is, uh, my students call me Mr. DP. Uh, my name is Daryl Pegram, and I am from San Bernardino, California. Okay, Mr. DP. Um, so our class is a sociology class based on sports. So I, I remember we had a conversation earlier with you about uh, that you used to play basketball. Uh, can you give us some detail about uh, maybe how the game of basketball or how you fell in love with the game of basketball? Um, basketball for me became a way of expression. I started playing seriously, competitively in the eighth grade. Uh, played all through high school. I went to A.B. Miller High School in Fontana, California, and then transferred to Worcester Academy Preparatory School in Worcester, Massachusetts to pursue basketball and academics. I went there after my sophomore year of high school, and I lived in Worcester in the dorms uh, my junior and senior year of high school. And basketball for me was discipline. Uh, basketball kept me on track. Basketball kept me out of trouble. Uh, basketball kept me focused, and I was able, fortunately, to use athletics to uh, uh, increase my impact on the world. Excellent, excellent. So, if you can explain a little bit in detail about the impact um, of basketball in your life, uh, traveling um, pretty much across the, the country for a private school, can can you please uh, give us like an example of how that impacted you? I mean. That's got to be hard. Well, it, it first taught me, it was the first thing it was, my, it was the first thing I ever sacrificed in my life. And as I've become older and I'm starting to you know, become more wiser, I realized that anything that you accomplish takes an incredible amount of sacrifice. And I made a sacrifice to, you know, uh, at that time, at 15, 16 years old, I didn't look at it as a sacrifice. I was just anxious to go and go play. But it was the ultimate sacrifice. I had to sacrifice holidays with my family. I, uh, my family was not out there with me at all, so I sacrificed being around my family. I sacrificed being around my childhood friends. I sacrificed being out there in the cold, in the cold, in the snow of Massachusetts, and versus the great weather we have here in Southern California. So for me, that experience taught me to sacrifice, and it wasn't a bad sacrifice. And sometimes we, as human beings, we look at sacrifice as this painful experience when it's really not. It's an experience to humble us and to help us grow and we all should learn how to sacrifice more. Yes, I do agree on that part. I do want to ask you a question about um, your college experience. Can you uh, give us some some intel of how your college experience went? Um, I had a very I had a very two-pronged college experience. Extreme highs and extreme lows. Uh, one thing that I have learned about athletics in general, especially at the, co at the collegiate level, is high school players are naive to the fact of how big of business it, college athletics are. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a huge financial industry, and I suffered two major injuries in my freshman year of college at a very high major basketball school. And once I became injured, the reception that I received from fans, from coaches, from administrators was not the same. You realize that you are there for a reason, and that is to play your sport, and that is to produce for that team, and so therefore you can produce revenue for that team. So once I learned that after my, uh, after my, inju after my injuries, I didn't look at uh, athletics the same, and I haven't since that day. I, you know, it, it took away a lot of the joy and fun from playing because it became so uh, business-oriented in you know, going on a full scholarship. You are obligated to fulfill that scholarship, and uh, it's tough. It's just a very tough thing to do. So regarding the fulfillment you're talking about, um, I guess you're, you're actually talking about the NCAA. Yes. That you are a student athlete. Yes. However, you see you see it differently, correct? Yes, yes. So when when did you actually officially acknowledge that to other to other people it was more of a business other than that you were the student at the university? Um, very quickly. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a full basketball scholarship to Indiana University. And I was there a year after they fired their legendary coach, Bob Knight. 
And so we had a first year head coach who was very inexperienced. And um, he flat out told me after I got hurt that I was there to play and that he needed me to play and that his job was at stake, basically. And so you have some coaches and other uh, uh, administrators who they look at they look at kids as their meal ticket. High, 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 uh, high grade recruits are the meal ticket for that program, for those coaches, for that athletic director, everybody. So it, I realized that very, very much early on, and it affected me since. I didn't, I didn't rehab the same after my, my knee injuries. I transferred schools after that point, and I actually became pretty much disenchanted with basketball. That's it. That's 15 good. minutes. I'm back there. I'll edit that part. Right. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you mind showing us your actual injuries? Yes, yes, yes. I had both of my quadriceps tendons repaired when I was 19 years old in my first semester at Indiana, I think it was 32 staples on that knee and about 31, 33 staples on this knee. So um, they gave me a, uh, 40, 30, a 35, 40% chance to ever play basketball again after my operations. There's an article in the San Bernardino County Sun that came out in 2004 that you can actually look up and read about it that the Sun wrote about me. When I transferred schools and um, it was a very very emotional time in my life it was very emotional because you felt like I felt like a piece of meat I felt like I was there just to play ball and I felt like after I got hurt I felt like my entire self-worth was over because I couldn't play at a high level anymore all right man I'm sorry to hear that actually that sounds kind of dark um, regarding the NCAA and also your sports, you know, the background in basketball, do you believe in any way that possibly race or ethnicity played a factor of maybe, you know, allowing students to be, you know, become actual, you know, student athletes? Yeah, race plays a huge factor and it is something that I am actually researching and I am trying to combat being an African American. It has now become, if you are a tall African-American or an athletic-looking African-American, it's automatic that people expect you to play a sport. And I think that's having a very negative impact on my culture and my people. Because now we have too many young athletes, male, uh, young students, male and female, who only see themselves and their future in athletic terms. And that has be, and that is, be, that's a direct correlation with the stigma that most African Americans are uh, better built and better to serve as athletes. As you look at the demographics and the statistics in both the NBA and NFL, they're predominantly African American. And that is uh, that's a good thing and a bad thing. I'm leaning toward more of it as a bad thing because our youth, um, who uh, Mr. Hector and I work with every day, are so disenchanted with any other avenue to succeed at life aside from athletics. And that's something that we need to get a grip on. It's something that we need to get a hold of because the truth statistics tell us that it is extremely hard to make it to the NFL and the NBA. And even if you do make it, your career, the average career is extremely short. And so I am out here trying to create awareness to these kids to let them know that you have to have not just the athletic prowess, but the academic prowess as well, because your life depends on it and you cannot put all your eggs in one basket. So pretty much you think if uh, these kids had a role model to follow, to kind of guide them in the right way, do you think things can possibly change? I think things could possibly change, but it's gonna take the pro athletes that we have now to really change the culture of it all because these are the people that these kids look up to. These are the people that these kids want to be. These are the kids, these are the people that these children listen to the most. So until we get more and more professional athletes and ex-athletes to come out and say that it's okay not to be an athlete. It's okay to be a scholar student. It's okay to put your academics first before athletics. It's okay to not make it. It's okay to want to do something else aside from being an athlete. It's okay. We need more pro athletes saying that. We need more collegiate athletes saying that because racially it is starting to 
uh, we are starting to have a trend where every uh, society perceives that every black person in college is an athlete. Or the only way that a young black person can go to college is if they are an athlete. And that is a completely false and negative perception and it's something that we need to change in our culture and our society as a whole. So changes, changes can, can make, make difference, you know, can make things change, actually happen. Uh, would you say um, now, or would, um, what I'm trying to say is from now to the past, do you think there's a big difference in student athletes or how students became athletes or maybe even tried to become athletes? It's a, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a huge difference from now in the past because of the money involved. Uh, if you look at the college football bowl series, huge dollars. If you look at March Madness, huge dollars, and it's increasing uh, day by day. People are making money off these athletes, so they're putting more and more pressure on these athletes to perform, and it's unfair. We are seeing more and more injuries than we have ever seen before at the collegiate and professional level. We are uh, seeing more mental issues amongst athletes than we have ever seen before at the collegiate and professional level. And it's because of all the stress and pressure that the powers to be put on these young people to perform for their monetary gain. And so that, that, is, that is the largest difference and it's something that we're gonna have to look at and combat. Um, last year there was a development by a player named Ed O'Bannon who played for UCLA in the 90s where he was able to sue the NCAA for some back money uh, they're able to sue EA Sports for making collegiate athlete games with the likeness of certain players, even though that they are not allowed to use the players' names. But they still use the players' likeness, jersey numbers, etc. So there were a few players who were able to get some back money from the NCAA and from EA Sports, but not entirely enough at all. And there's a lot of work to do. And I think a lot of the, mo the majority of the work starts at home. We need more and more parents who are pushing their kids to be athletes, to push them to be better citizens and better students, first and foremost. So it all starts at home. Yep. I totally agree with that. Regarding starting at home, did do you think an impact though, going back a little bit, what you were saying, if these professional athletes can maybe start some, some kind of like motto or, or maybe some kind of change by saying, hey, you know, how you were saying it's okay you know to not be an athlete it's okay not to you know be this or that do you think if possible if this were to start do you think you might see some changes yes it will i will i mean just imagine if we had lebron james or or any pro athlete come and teach a seminar to high school kids high school kids on you know what maybe you should want to be an owner before an actual player you know maybe you Maybe you, maybe you would be great in the front office and be a general manager or a president of basketball operations, director of basketball operations, or a scout or an executive. There are so many careers in the athletic field that athletes do not know about, they're not taught about, and they're not pushed or encouraged to pursue. I mean, you can, it, you, you can be a, a general manager of a pro team and have a 15, 20 year career and still be a millionaire. Kids do not understand that, they don't know that. They, they, they're not hearing it, don't, don't, don't want to hear it. You can be a director of uh, team operations, you can be a scout, you can be an assistant coach, you can be a head coach, you, you, you can be in the marketing department of some of these pro teams, you can be in the finance department of some of these pro teams, you can be in the, uh, in the sociological department of these, of these pro teams because these teams have sociology departments of their teams where they're looking at cultural trends. They're looking at societal trends. They're looking at everything, studying uh, the background of these kids, you know, and who better than do that than the people who come from those same environments of the future generations of athletes. But our youth are not being pushed in those directions. They're not being guided in those directions. And what we need is more former athletes in management positions. And when I say former athletes, they don't have to be pro athletes or college athletes. You know, people love sports who never played past middle school sports, but they still grow up loving sports and they need to understand that it's not go pro or bust. You can still be successful in athletics without being an athlete. And if we have more pro athletes teaching our youth that, we can change part of the culture. And what we'll see is overall communities get better because we'll have uh, more young people engaging in other extracurricular activities aside from just athletics.
if you had a chance to change one thing or possibly to make you know to voice out to the community or maybe professional athletes student athletes anything what would that one choice be well uh i'm gonna stick with the theme of uh uh, my culture and my, my background, African-Americans, that if you are African-American, it does not mean you have to play a sport. If you are tall, that does not mean you have to play a sport. If you happen to be muscular or of athletic build, that does not mean you have to play a sport. That should not be the expectations and the criteria that we put on our young people from birth. I have seen parents uh, with four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and six-year-olds talking about their growing pro. There's nothing wrong with wanting that, but you have to have alternative goals. That cannot be your main goal. And parents should not be pushing that on their children at that young of age. So that would be the one thing that I would change because I want to see more, uh, I want to see more African Americans who are sports agents. I want to see more African Americans who are more athlete business managers. I want to see more African Americans in the front offices of major sports and pro teams. That that would be my dream to really to really see that manifest. That's that's very strong. And I agree with the change. The changes must happen. Um, you know, just going back a little bit more, um, but did you have any motivation or push when you were younger um, to become a star? You know, basketball player? Do you have aspirations for it? Of course. Of course. Uh, uh, adoration, I think I think I said that word correctly, is, uh, is a hell of a drug. <laughs> you know, people clapping for you is a hell of a drug. People chanting your name is a hell of a drug. Uh, being the big man on campus is a hell of a drug. It's addicting. And so, yeah, of course, I wanted to be my best. Uh, I wanted to be my best for myself. I wanted to be my best to receive the recognition also. And we have to be careful of that too because we are pushing our kids to want to receive this recognition. And when they don't get it, or when they're used to getting it and they don't get it anymore, what happens to them psychologically? Yeah. What happens to them emotionally? I can tell you what happens because I lived it and I went through it. I transferred from Indiana University to a small school, Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. Indiana had about 45,000 students. Indiana had, I mean, I'm sorry, Indiana had about 45,000 students. Loyola only had about 4,000 students. So it was a complete culture shock for me. At Indiana, basketball players are, you know, that's the premier sport of the school. You're looked at as, it was, it was basically being in a pro system already. You're looked at as gods almost. I didn't get that adoration anymore. I didn't get those, I didn't, I didn't get the, the perks of being a, 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 a high major athlete anymore when I transferred schools, and it really, really did mess with me psychologically and emotionally. And it really, after my surgeries, uh, for a couple of years there, for a lot of years there, I tanked as a person and became, and, and lost who I was and became somebody that I wasn't. And I believe that every single major collegiate sports program, and they have the money for it, they should have a team psychologist. They really should, because, uh, being an athlete is 90% mental as it is. So what are we doing for our former athletes who, for, it was, for athletics, it was all that they knew. What happens when they can't play anymore? Who's talking to them? Who's, help, who's trying to help them out? And I guarantee you it's not the coach because that coach all it cares about is winning those games and keeping those paychecks coming. Yes. Well, Mr. DP, I'd like to thank you for this interview. Fortunately, we are out of time. So thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank, thank you, you for sharing your, your story, your enlightenment, um, your views, your passion, you know, your ups, your downs. It, it was very, very informative. Um, I do agree with you on a lot of things. And, you know, I hate to hear the story that, you know, you had your falls with your surgeries and then you had, you had a chance to see the actual way of how the NCAA works behind back doors. Um, I agree that students should look at academic roles. Um, that was very, very, that's my, kind of like my passion right. towards you, which I agree on a lot. Me and you kind of have the same views. Right. <laughs> and I think change is a must. I think a lot of the professionals, business people need to come out and speak out to kids and, and let them know there are other options. You know, not just because you're African American, you're right. tall, you're buff, you know. The stigma of saying you know you're you're naturally born that way that you right. should have to be an athlete no 
You can become, you know, a businessman, an entrepreneur, right. a scientist, a team owner, you know, a team owner, you know, own your own team right. and still be successful in life. Right. And which I share with you passionately. So again, Mr. DP. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. And if, and if the class needs anything from me, please let me know. I'm here. I'm, I'm here whenever. Thank you. And I will share more information about you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.